All right, church, man, I, I can't tell you how much uh, it, it is personally satisfying to just get to worship with you. All right, just praying this morning that God would show up and visit us in this place. And I tell you what, uh, when you all were singing that song, I trust in God, I actually am like, you know what, we're going to switch the response song to that song because I feel like there's... A lot of folks, it's like, I really need to express my trust in God. And so again, whether you are, whatever county you're in, we're one church in a bunch of different rooms. We're one church with one mission uh, to take, take, take the one name, the one name that will save one more into our communities. And so whether you're in Macon County or Transylvania County or Buncombe County or Henderson County, take your Bible. Turn to a, in some cases, a well-known passage, but John chapter three is where we're gonna be. John chapter three. Again, thank you for just buying into the fact that, you know what, I'm going to stay where I am, I'm going to serve where I live, and I'm going to be the church in my community and continue to pray. We're uh, soon going to hopefully start going vertical on the Waynesville campus, so you pray for that. Got a permit or two uh, left, but you know how permits go. Sometimes it's quick, sometimes it's slow. Pray that it will be super, super quick. And by the way, if you have one of these one-at-a-time journals, again, I think we're almost out. I would definitely know we're going to be out after today. You can uh, download it online. As I told you before, we're like, how many should we order? We ordered 10,000 of these scripture journals. And you guys were like, just like vultures on a carcass. I mean, you just went after these things and these are all but, all but gone. So if you do have one of those, we're going to be on page number uh, 34, page number 34. Let me set it up this way, because we're going to look at a, a passage, uh, particularly one verse that for some of us, even if you're new to Bible study, this is a verse you've, you've heard. And I'll tell you where it really jumped, you know, way up, where 90 million, 90 million people Googled this verse a number of years ago. But a number of years ago, uh, our friend, and you know, he's a friend of our church, uh, Tim Tebow was playing in the national championship game against my wife's team, the University of Oklahoma. And needless to say, I mean, not only did, not only did he spank the University of Oklahoma, but also underneath him, he had this eye black and the eye black underneath it on one cheek, it said, John, on the other one, it said 316. And during, during the national championship game, 90 million people Googled the verse, John 316. Fast forward exactly three years later, three years later, Tebow was playing in his first playoff game. He's a quarterback for the Denver Broncos at this point. They're playing the Pittsburgh Steelers. That's that time where he like, throws the winning touchdown pass. In overtime, everybody goes crazy. He pounds the, the dirt with his fist. And then later on, after they got some of the statistics in, here's what happened in that playoff game. He averaged 31.6 yards per completion. He threw for exactly 316 yards. CBS's ratings were 31.6. The Steelers' time of possession was 31 minutes and six seconds. He averaged 3.16 yards per carry. And so even though they say you can't wear the eye black, that happened and people were interviewing him and they're like, what do you think? What kind of coincidence was that, that all of those stats would come to John 3.16? And that's, that's where Tebow goes. A lot of people say it's a coincidence. You know what I say? I say that's a big God. And so even if you are new to the Bible study, John 3.16 is a verse that you've either heard about, you've seen at a stadium, and it is an amazing verse. What's even more amazing is the context of John 3.16 is about a conversation that Jesus has with a very good man, a very religious man, a very moral man. And this conversation is one of many that we're going to be in for the next about three months. Because what we're looking at is how Jesus had the amazing, amazing tendency to look at a crowd and then focus in on the one. And maybe that's where you are today. You came in here and you've got a bunch of questions. You've got about a bunch of thoughts about, you know, what would Jesus think of me? What would Jesus say to me? And we are so glad that you are here. We're so glad you're watching online as well. Because what Jesus does for this man in the scriptures, Jesus will do for you and meet you right where you are. But in the middle of this, what we're going to see is we're going to fly by some questions, oftentimes questions that people, even seasoned believers, tend to have. Questions like, you know what, can I, can I actually, can I lose my salvation? Can I know for sure, can I know for sure 
that I'm actually saved because it's like, hey, one time I looked at this place where Jesus said, hey, to all these religious people that had done a bunch of good stuff. I mean, they'd been like preachers. They had been healing people. They'd been doing all this church stuff. And at the end, he's like, you know, depart from me. I didn't, I didn't know you. And that verse scares me to death. So can I actually know that I know that I know? I don't have to walk around with a question mark. I can walk around with an exclamation point knowing, you know what? I'm actually, I'm actually a saved person. Can I know that? And then what does Jesus actually mean when he says born again? Is that Jesus? Is that Jimmy Carter? I mean, exactly how do we know what that is? How does that become a reality? What does that even look like? What changes have to take place? So John chapter three, we're gonna hit those questions a little by little. I'm gonna walk us through the passage. John chapter three, we're gonna start actually in verse one and then we're gonna end with verse 16. So follow along with me. John chapter three, verse one says now, Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This means he was like super religious. If you're new to church, you see in the New Testament, particularly this group of religious people called the Pharisees, they come up all the time, they butt heads with Jesus. This one actually says he's the ruler of the Jews, which means he's like graduate level, a place called the Sanhedrin. These people were super, super, super serious about the Bible. He would have started memorizing the Bible when he was in kindergarten. He would have memorized all 613 laws that God gave us. He was part of the group also, though, that began to get so into the word, so into the word, they began to be so consumed that nobody would even break the law. They put laws by the law so nobody would get near the law to begin with. And so it would be like today, maybe you all grew up in an environment where, for example, it's like you can't say the word darn, because it's so close to the real word, don't even say darn. I met somebody who's like, you know what? We couldn't even go to a theater because the chance is somebody could see us walking into a theater, think we were going to an R-rated movie, and so we just can't go to a theater at all. My point is they're very serious about the Bible. They're very serious about the law. This is the guy that comes to Jesus. And he comes to Jesus by night And he says to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. This is actually a pretty respectful introduction. We know that you are a teacher come from God for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with them. And so here's what he's doing. Here's a man, he's coming to Jesus. He initially asked some questions about the miracles Jesus has been performing. Jesus has already turned the water into wine At the end of the book of John, it says Jesus did so many more things that if we wrote them in a book, the world could not contain all the books. So at this point, Jesus had done a number of miracles. Nicodemus is like, man, nobody can do those unless you come from God. And what Jesus is gonna do is he's gonna flip it upside down and say, you came with a question about miracles and I'm gonna tell you, you're not gonna understand the miracles until there's a miracle done inside of you to begin with. So, verse three. Jesus answered him and said, truly, truly, I say to you, again, truly, truly does not mean some of the stuff Jesus said was false. This was like, pay attention, get off Facebook, pay attention. It's like your mama, when they would use, she would use your full name. Like when my mom really wanted to get my attention, she's like, Bruce Pittman, Frank, come here. What that meant is truly, truly, I say unto you, you better get over here. That's what it is. And loved ones, here's my biggest fear. And what I want you to know, I've said this to you probably 10 times throughout the year. What you're gonna see in Nicodemus is a warning for us. Because Nicodemus not only knew the Bible, Nicodemus actually was hanging around Jesus. And one of the biggest warnings that you see a number of times in the scriptures is listen, make sure you're not just about, I know the Bible, make sure you're not just hanging around Jesus. Because what is clear in this conversation is you can know the Bible, You can hang around Jesus, you can hang around Jesus' people and yet not know Jesus. That this guy was actually so close to the Messiah who he had studied about for years since he was a kid, he could smell the breath of God, but he couldn't recognize the Messiah. He couldn't recognize the Son of God. That scares me, that you would come to church and hang around and sing the songs and talk about Jesus and yet you would actually not, not be born again. That is frightening. So Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. This is an absolute. This is not a tertiary issue. This is an absolute issue. Jesus is 
being super clear because he didn't even ask him about this. He just came up to him, wanted to know maybe about, hey, how do I do that water to wine deal? And Jesus is like, listen, you gotta know this. If you're not born again, you will not go to heaven. You just will not see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus, he goes right over Nicodemus' head. I mean, Nicodemus is like one of the smartest guys in Israel. Nicodemus has got like a PhD in Bible. And then when the son of God says, you must be born again, he's like, what, what? And look at verse four, he says, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And you're gonna see Jesus like, what? No, can't, that's gross. I mean, don't, what are you even talking? That's illegal in all states but Tennessee. I mean, now you cannot, you cannot do that. No, don't do that. It's not what he's talking about, but he doesn't understand it at all. And this guy, again, knows the Bible over and over and over again. And what Jesus is essentially telling this religious man who is respectful of Jesus, but doesn't recognize Jesus. That's what you got to understand. He was respectful of Jesus. He calls him rabbi. He comes to him with a question. But what happens is he doesn't revere Jesus at this point. Again, my question to you is, have you been born again? You gotta ask that question throughout the message. How do you know that you have? What difference has it actually made? Have you been born again? That's what he's asking. And Nicodemus is like, what? I don't even understand that at all. And so Jesus is pressing in on him. Listen, it's not about just you memorizing the scriptures. He's like, you have got to be, you've got to be, you've got to be born again. And he has no clue. And that's why he's like, well, how do, you, do I jump back in there? I mean, go to, how, no. So here's verse five. Jesus answered, says it again. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. And he says, do not marvel, because that's what Nicodemus was doing. He was marveling. He was astonished that Jesus had looked at him as a religious person and said, you must be, you must be born again. So the two questions I'm gonna to try to put the verses around, number one, question number one is why? Why is that? Why would Jesus tell a religious person, a moral person, a person who read the Bible, a person who memorized the Bible, a person who went to church, a person who sang the song, a person who tithed his income, a person who checked off all of the boxes, and he looks at this religious, moral, good man and says, you're not gonna to go to heaven unless you are born again. And so the question you've gotta ask is why? Why must I be born again, because what he's saying implicitly is I need a new birth because something is wrong with my, something's wrong with my first birth is what he is saying. That despite all of your good works, you gotta be born again. Now, when I was trained on how to share the gospel, every time that I was trained on how to share the gospel, it always started off with the good news. And I've probably been trained in about five different ways to share the gospel. And they're all good, but it usually would start off with, a, with the good news. And the good news would be, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Something like that. And that's fine. That's a great place to start. I want to say that just to say that's not where Jesus starts in this conversation. He doesn't start with the good news. He starts with the bad news. He says, religious man, moral man, church man, you're not going to go to heaven unless you have been born a second time. Or in other words, if you were only born one time, you're gonna die twice, a physical death and a spiritual death. If you were born twice, you're only gonna die one time. Now I know this presses against our culture because in our culture, and it's been this way for a long time, it's maybe accelerated a little bit now, but we are told from the time we were in kindergarten that we're a little snowflake, okay? We're a little skittle. We're, you're a skittle, you're a snowflake, you're unique, you're a little rainbow, whatever. And I'm not saying your kindergarten teacher was necessarily a liar, but she was a liar because that's actually not what we're, we're little sinners is what we are. And that's what the Bible paints for us. Now, the, I'm gonna give you the bad news and then we're gonna go to the good news. And I wanna show it to you by a portrait that actually happened way back before we even moved to Texas. We, we lived in Atlanta and my dad who was alive at the time, he's like, we're gonna get a portrait made with four boys, <laughs> the four brothers, us, and we're gonna give that to mom, and I can't remember if it was a birthday, Mother's Day, or something like that. So kind of put that, put that uh, awesome picture, leave that up there for a second. 
Man, those are cute little whippersnappers, correct? Those are cute little guys. If you don't know, I'm the one on uh, the left. I'm the one with the tie. You're like, we've never seen you with a tie before. Now you have, all right? That's the only time you're gonna see it unless I'm marrying you or burying you. That is actually the tie that I was wearing. So here's what, we look so peaceful. I'm not sure we look kind of like, we had that Mona Lisa smile just a little bit or lack of a smile, but that's us. Can I let you know what was going on behind the scenes of that picture? Because you try to get four young boys to sit still to get a portrait, man. That's a painting. It's not a snapshot. That's a portrait. We were hellions is what we were behind this whole thing. We were screaming. We were fussing. We were taking that clip on tie off. We were trying to do anything but say, you know what? Here we are. Nice little angelic little boys. All right. We were little hellions even in that portrait. So here's the portrait that I want you to listen to for just a second. Again, the portrait that the Bible teaches about a person who has not been born again, it's not pretty. It doesn't try to wash over it. If you haven't been born again, because here's the deal. If you don't understand this part, even if you are born again, what happens is you don't appreciate it as much as you should. We kind of get used to it. Matter of fact, when I was doing a podcast a couple weeks ago, one of our worship pastors he said, when they first moved here, what happened was that they would have, invite people to Western North Carolina and they would always, without fail, they want to take them to the Pisgah Inn because of the view. I mean, the view at the Pisgah Inn is unbelievable. You're looking out over, I don't know how many miles. And he said, what happened is over the course of months and then after a couple of years, when people would come in town, they were like, eh, we can, yeah, whatever. And, and the luster, it was gone. The amazement of that view was gone. Now it was just like, ah, oh, we've seen that before. It, we're used to it. You and I have to be careful. That is not what happens to you as a believer. And what helps in understanding that is the portrait God paints of us if we're not born again. So here's a quick, here's a quick overview. John chapter, th- don't write these down or, don't, or you can write them down. Don't look at them. But the portrait at John three nineteen, among many places says that we are morally, we are morally evil. Matthew chapter nine, he says, we are spiritually sick. Ephesians chapter two says, we are children of wrath, that we deserve the wrath of God. Romans chapter five actually says, we are enemies of God. Now, by the way, sometimes people are like, well, you know, I don't like to use the word saved. I mean, it sounds so redneck. I mean, the word saved. I mean, it's like, why would I use the word saved? My question is, what other word is appropriate? Improved? I mean, uh, helped out a little bit. When you, look at, when you look at our condition, does it make you want to go, you know what, I th- Jesus has enhanced me a little bit. That's not it at all. It's he has saved me. He has rescued me. The Bible actually says we are spiritually dead. Dead. Not Princess Bride dead, like just a little bit dead. I'm not saying that. We're like completely dead. I think it's been a number of years since I told you this story. But years ago, I took my son to uh, Mali, West Africa. It's a failed state now. It wasn't very good back then in regards to safety and all that kind of stuff. But what you would do is you would go from village to village and you would share the gospel. The presentation we knew was going from creation to the cross. And so it was like a five minute presentation. When you walked into the town, you typically had to ask permission to go into the town and then you had to ask permission to leave, all right? So you'd ask permission either of the, I think they called him the mayor, maybe the king, I think is what you called him. You also had an imam who was there too, and he had to kind of sign off on this as well. So fast forward a little bit. We're in one of our last towns. We walk into this place. We, this one had a little school. We share the gospel from creation to the cross. And I was like at the end, I'm like, how many of you all want to be born again? And all these kids raise their hand. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, who wouldn't want, that's like the best thing in the world. And then some of the men, some of the teachers also raised their hand. I mean, God moved in an amazing way. But then you had to ask permission to leave. And so we're making this little single file line through the village to go to this one place because I'd heard that the quote, that the imam wanted to meet with me. That's not really what you want to hear when you are the other side of the world at the mercy to some degree in your mind of what the imam's going to do. And then so we go in this place. It's a little hut. Everybody's circled around. People are hanging off the hut looking in because only men could go into the hut. So we're talking with, there's like, here's the chief and here's the mayor and here's the king and there's the imam. 
And bro, I'm just gonna tell you, that Iman, I was right on the verge of thinking that guy's head is gonna spin around and he's gonna spit pea green soup at me. That's what I was saying. I was like, this is, this is not good. So the guy nervously, our connection says, why don't you share the gospel? So I go from creation to the cross. I, do, I go through the gospel presentation. I'll tell you what happens later because actually the king ends up repenting and embracing Christ right there. But right before that, here's what happens. The imam, knowing what had happened to the school, he says, I have a gift. We can't, we, the translator's like, he, the imam has a gift for you. I promise you, this is not a preacher's story. This is not enhanced in the, the least bit. You can ask Tyler, all right? They bring out a chicken by the neck who I'm assuming, it would be a correct assumption. Again, I am, I'm not a big farm guy. I mean, you know, I like Chick-fil-A, but I mean, I'm not in bed and around a bunch of chickens. So he gives me a chicken. And so I actually go through creation of the cross holding this dead chicken. And so I'm going through it and I'm like, I'm like, my only thought was don't drop the chicken, all right? Cause you're like, lose your man card and they won't listen to the gospel presentation. No, I've got that chicken by the neck, strong. And I promise you, I get to, I get to the part where, where I said, because I've gone I'm five minutes into, I get to the part when it's like, and Jesus was raised, because I got this, Jesus was raised from the dead. I promise you as the Lord is my witness. I said, Jesus is raised from the dead. That chicken, so, I mean, it goes, no. my boy's eyes were like this. Actually, mine were probably like that as well. And I'm sitting there going, oh, and I would say, that's a fairly effective evangelistic technique if you can get the chicken to do that on cue. All right, but he did, he did that. And I was, I, I was, I didn't know what, I didn't know what happened. I was like chicken raised from the dead. I didn't know what happened. So I closed it out. It was awesome. We ended up discipling the king a little bit. And my, I'm not thinking that the chicken, the chicken didn't get raised from the dead. The chicken apparently was just like a little bit dead. It wasn't all the way dead. He's just a little bit dead. What you need to understand is, listen, you were spiritually all the way dead. Nothing you could bring to God with your resume saying, hey, aren't you impressed with my resume? Look at this little bit of spiritual vitality that I have. I'm bringing that to you. And that's why Jesus says, listen, you are born of the flesh. Born of the flesh, it is, it is flesh. He's like, Nicodemus, you need more than religion. You need more than the rules. You need a resurrection. That is what you need. So here's the way it goes on. It says the wind blows where it wishes and you hear its sound. Every time I read this verse, I always think of that. I think it was like a DC talk sound and Billy Graham was in the background. It's like, you can't see the wind, but you can only see the effects of the wind. I'm like, man, it's like, yes. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear its sound and you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. In other words, you can't direct it. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. Let me tell you what seems like it's going on because it happens here a couple other times. We'll be able to look at one more. This is kind of a rabbi technique that Jesus is using. The rabbis, they would oftentimes teach in like sections of three. Like look at Luke 15 one time and you see him teaching in three stories, 1.3 different stories. You know, lost sheep, lost son, lost silver. You see those. And he's doing something similar here. He's actually referring. Remember, this guy knew the Old Testament backwards and forwards. And you're going to see that he goes back to the prophet Ezekiel. He also uses a guy named Moses in the Bible. And then actually in John 3, 16, there's a little bit of an allusion to Abraham when he's like, you know, your only begotten son. So here's what, just jot this down in your notes. Jot down Ezekiel 36 and 37. Let me read you a couple of verses. Ezekiel 36 and 37, verse 25 says, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleanliness. And wouldn't that be an awesome thing if you could leave church today and go all my rebellion, all my sin, all my secrets, all my stuff, all my shame has been wiped away because of what Jesus has done. We talk about awesome being able to walk out of here with not just a clean soul, but a clean conscience. This is an allusion to the new covenant because here's what he says. He says, from all your idols, I will cleanse you and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh. Now, this is one of the wildest scenes right after this in the scriptures. 
Because right after chapter 36 in Ezekiel, God gives Ezekiel this vision in chapter 37. It's known as the Valley of Dry Bones. And what happens is, he says, Ezekiel, come out here. And he shows him this vision of all these dry, these dry bones. In other words, they have no life in them at all. No life at all. He's like, Ezekiel, can these bones live? And Ezekiel doesn't really know the answer. He's like, oh, only you know God, only you know God. And then God begins to, begins to breathe on these bones and then sinew and tendons and all this stuff starts to come up there. And what Ezekiel thought was dead, when God breathed on that, became alive. A loved one, that is a great, that's a great reminder for the church. It's also a great reminder for this year of one. Number one, that's essentially what the church is. All of us right here, all of us all over the place, you know what the church is? It's a bunch of dead people, a bunch of dead people, no spiritual life at all. God breathed on you, raised you up, and now you and I are an army. It also speaks to your one. Some of you are having doubts that your one can ever, ever, ever have a relationship with Jesus. And what I'm gonna tell you is, listen, God's the one that breathes new life into somebody. And you need to be praying with faith and belief that, you know what, my one is not too far gone. God's arm is not too short to save. Just like he, just like he breathed life on a bunch of dead bones, he can do the same thing to the person that I love and I'm praying for. So, you want to, it's like, what happens when that happens? You talk about that new portrait. The portrait, as bad as it was behind the scenes, the new portrait of somebody actually coming to Christ is that, he says, you're clean, you are justified, you are forgiven of all of your sins, you are adopted into God's family, you are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, you have the righteousness of Christ on your life, your sin nature has been defeated, you have been gifted with a spiritual gift for the service of others, your condemnation is gone, you have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies, you've gone from an enemy of God to now you are a friend of God, you have gone from darkness, and the Bible says you have now gone into light. So... Nicodemus said to him, <laughs> how can these things be? Remember what he's talking about. He's like, you're talking about a new birth and you're talking about wind. And by the way, in the scriptures, when you see the word wind and the word spirit, it oftentimes is the same word. It's the idea of the breath of God, that God breathes on. Remember like, if you go back to Adam and Eve, what happened? He breathes on them, him the breath of life and the Bible says he became a living soul. That's what he does for you spiritually. When you're without Christ, he breathes on you. You come to faith in Christ. You repent and embrace him. And then God gives you that spiritual life. And so Nicodemus said, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, are you the teacher of Israel? And yet you do not understand these things. In other words, you dummy. I mean, you, you've been reading about this stuff. You've been reading about the law and I'm the lawgiver, and I'm right in front of you and you don't see it. Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know bear witness to what we have seen and you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you don't believe them, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? Now look, check out verse 13. Verse 13, he says, no one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven. By the way, ascended into heaven, that's a great picture of religion. I'm gonna do a bunch of stuff to ascend the mountain of God. Again, whatever that stuff is, I'm gonna be a good person, I'm going to uh, align my chakra. I'm going to try to obey the 10 commandments. I'm gonna make a trip to Mecca. I'm gonna do whatever it is. That's every other religion but the gospel. I'm gonna do stuff to ascend to heaven. And yet he says, but no one has done that except he who descended from heaven, the son of man. That's the idea that Jesus comes on a rescue mission for you, comes from the mountain on that rescue mission and it's all grace. So I want you to think about that. Grace is one of the hardest concepts that for you and I to ever accept because there's nothing we add to it despite how much we want to. So if somebody comes up to you, because actually when we try to add to it, it's in some ways an insult to God. You'd be insulted too if somebody came up to you and said, hey, I'm gonna give you this $70,000 truck. Man, I love you. I wanna give you a $70,000 truck. Just, just here it is. Let's say his name is whatever, Jim. Your friend Jim's gonna give you a $70,000 truck. And you're like, oh, Jim, that's amazing, that's amazing. And then you like take out a quarter or something, you're like, hey, I don't want you to pay for all of it, here's like a quarter. And then somebody asks you, hey, where'd you get the slick truck? That truck is awesome, man. That's a Ford F-150, isn't it? Yes, it is a Ford F-150, yes, it is. I love that truck. He's like, Jim and I bought that together. What? You and Jim didn't buy that together? 
Jim would be insulted. Jim was like, no, that's a gift. That's just a 100% gift. That's what being born again is. It's like, oh, how does that even happen? Well, check out what's going on in the last few verses. Because again, he's gonna go to another little rabbinical technique and use a Bible verse to explain another Bible verse. So how am I born again? Verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the son of man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Now this goes back to a book in the Bible called the book of Numbers. It's a pretty depressing book, to be honest with you. And so what happens, he's going back to a time, and you might not be, you probably have heard of Moses, or you might have heard of Moses, think you know, Christian Baal. So just think, you know, Moses, okay? But Moses is leading, Moses is leading the people to the promised land. And they start to gripe and complain to God about stuff that three months earlier they were praying to God for. I mean, we would never do that, would we? I mean, we would never complain about stuff that a few months ago we were actually asking God for. We'd never complain about a job that God has given us now that three months ago we were begging God to please give us a job. We would never complain about our spouses who four months ago you were asking God, please don't let her walk out the door. You would never, com- we would never do that. We'd never complain about our kids, all right? We'd never complain about our kids, you know, who were like, God, please give us a baby. And now it's like, oh man, if I could just get two hours of sleep. We would never complain about the traffic as we drive the car that we prayed for six months. We'd never complain about that because essentially that's what sin is. Sin is being dissatisfied with God and then eventually we're so dissatisfied with God, we look to these other idols to try to satisfy us. And so that's what they were doing. And so God does something crazy and what he does, he actually sends some serpents. I told you this crazy story. Sends these serpents and the people are crying out in pain which really that's a picture of the bitterness of sin. That's the bitterness of idolatry. Anytime we try to be fully and finally satisfied with all these other things and we forget God, eventually it turns around on us and bites us. That's what happens. And so what he does, he tells Moses, he's like, Moses, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take one of those serpents. I want you to take a bronze serpent, mold a bronze serpent, and I want you to hold it up. And anybody who looks at the bronze serpent is gonna be healed. He's like, Nicodemus, you remember that story? I mean, Nicodemus at this point is like, yeah, I've taught that story in Connect Group 10 times. And I know that story. I teach people that story. And then Jesus is going to go, listen, just like Moses lifted up the serpent and people who looked at him actually got got healed the same way, the same way, the same way I'm going to be lifted up. And anybody who looks toward me will be healed of their sin as well. So verse 16, for God so loved the world, so is an amplifier. It's like you got... I'm sure we got amplifiers somewhere in this, in this stuff. And what does it do? It takes music and it puts it out there super loud. And what he says here is he says, for God so, God amplified, God wanted you to see. You think what Moses did? You think what God did with Moses to heal those people of a snake bite? You think that's awesome? I'll tell you, awesome. What's awesome is that I'm going to be lifted up, the one who knew no sin to be sin on your behalf that you might become the righteousness of me. That's awesome. And that's why it says, so God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Now that little whoever is a big, that's an awesome, awesome invitation. Because that means whether you're separated from God because of your rebellion. Because again, anytime, anytime you've got a number of people, there's always enough people that are like, you don't know what I've done. You don't know where I've been. You don't know what wickedness I've done. You don't know what I did on spring break. You don't know what happened at prom last week. You don't know any of that stuff at all. But if you're in the whosoever, the whosoever category, guess what? Then that's you. This is not cheap grace though, by the way. Anytime you talk about grace, somebody's gonna say it's cheap grace. And there is such a thing as cheap grace. Cheap grace is when you don't understand how much it costs God's son when you just kind of pander over the sin, but that's not what this is doing. It's like sin was a big deal. It cost Jesus's death on a cross. It's costly grace. So this is not some license to sin. This is not like, hey, pray a prayer and go live any way you want to. I'm gonna get to that in a second. This is costly grace. This is like, look what it costs God's son. But on the other hand, it's not just if you're rebellious, you can also be separated from God because you are religious and that's Nicodemus. Nobody's more religious in this room. Nobody's more religious at Biltmore Church than Nicodemus. I mean, how many verses you got memorized? Most Pharisees, particularly if you were part of the Sanhedrin, some, some commentators say they would have had the whole Old Testament memorized. The whole Old Testament, really? 
You got the book of Leviticus memorized? I mean, we were kind of like shocked when Platt came up here and memorized and gave you guys three chapters in Psalms. This is like the whole Old Testament this guy had memorized. He prayed, he tithed. And listen, he did, when he tithed, you can look in other passages where Jesus is like, hey, what you did is good. He's not just tithing on the, he's not tithing on the net. This brother's tithing, tithing on the growth, the gross, okay? So um, it says you gotta believe in him too. Now, if you underline in your Bible, just underline that word believes, believes in him. We talked about this word enough. It means to trust or to place your weight on. I'm not gonna trust my religion. I'm not gonna trust my righteousness. I'm not doing that anymore. You know, Jesus actually, his first sermon, here's the way he starts it off, Mark chapter one. He says, repent and believe, repent and believe. And that confuses people sometimes because like, is it repentance or is it belief? Which one is it? It's really important for you to understand that repentance and belief are like two sides of the same coin. So like I got a quarter, if you're like, hey, which one is that quarter? Is it heads or is it tails? And I was like, no, it's one quarter. Yeah, but it, heads or tails? No, it's, you don't understand, it's one quarter. And when you think about faith, to understand it's repentance and faith, that helps you understand some of the misunderstandings of what faith is. Because in our day and time, faith means a whole bunch of different stuff. So here's a few things that it's not. Here's what faith is not. Faith is not just a mental agreement that I, you know, I believe Jesus died for my sin. I've been going to church here a long time, brother. That's not what faith is. Faith, the Bible says the demons even believe like that. And they, at least they shudder. In other words, they're like, oh my goodness. They at least have a, some kind of fear of God. So it's not just a mental assent. It's also not just, and listen to me carefully so you don't misunderstand me. It is not simply praying a prayer or filling out a card or raising your hand. Can those be legitimate expressions of what the Bible says to call on the name of the Lord? They can be. They can be, for sure. So hear me on that. That can be a legitimate expression of repentance and faith. What I'm pleading with you is like that doing that and only that is not necessarily, not necessarily, it's not like, it's not necessarily being born again. It's also, and because, let me give you this example. So let's say you go to a wedding. If you go to a wedding, you've seen the bride and the groom up there, man, it looks awesome. Spent a lot of money on the wedding. Everything's going great. Even the groom has like got a tear in his eyes as he looks at her and he looks at his bride and he's like, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, till death do his part. I love you. I mean, it, it is, he is that guy. All the girls are like, oh, that's amazing. And the, the bride is like, awesome. I mean, this is my this is, this is him, this is him. And then suppose you're at that wedding and you walk away thinking, man, that was 100% sincere. And then all of a sudden, just a week or two later, you find out that that groom was cheating on his bride during their honeymoon. I'm talking about a couple of days after he said those words, all of a sudden he is cheating on his brand new bride. I know what you would think. You would think that what he said in front of all of us with a tear in his eye, it wasn't legitimate. He didn't mean it. It was insincere. He couldn't have meant it because if he really meant it, I'm not saying he's going to be perfect, but that brother's not going to be cheating on her two days later on the honeymoon. You would say that is insincere. Again, can a prayer be good evidence? Can that be an acknowledgement? Can that be you surrendering to the Lordship of Jesus? Absolutely. But the confidence is really not ever mentioned in the scripture. Did you pray a prayer? Did you fill out a card? Did you raise your hand? The confidence is what's going on right now because if you got something with Jesus right now, that is making clear. If you got something going on with him now, then definitely something back then happened. There was a starting point at some point, but the Bible never says go back and look way back at that starting point to be an evidence or an expression that you got something actually that never leaves you. No, he says you look now. This is actually in the present tense, which means you have something going on currently. It doesn't mean just feeling bad about your sin. It doesn't mean you're getting religious. It doesn't mean partial surrender. It's not, you don't follow Jesus like you follow somebody on Facebook, all right? It's like, you know what? I'm kind of following a bunch of people on Facebook and I can take them and I can like some of the stuff they say and some of the stuff they say I don't like. Sometimes I do what they say and sometimes I don't do what they say. All right, here's what it is also not it is not perfection. This is not trying to get you to necessarily doubt that you were born again, but I am trying to be clear to understand. 
has that changed? It's not perfection. You're still gonna have some struggle with sin. As a matter of fact, one of the ways you know is that when you struggle and when you fall, what is your attitude when you are on the ground? When idolatry one more time has gotten the best of you, when you have such remorse and repentance, you're like, I can't believe I did. That in and of itself, if you get up and run back to God, that's actually evidence that you know what? Jesus is Lord. Jesus is my boss. He is my master. I'm running back to him. Because if you find yourself there and you never run to him to begin with, the chances are you actually never switched allegiances to begin with. So what is it? Think about it this way. The Bible says it is by grace through faith. By grace through faith. So think about grace. Grace is like God's nail-scarred hand reaching down and saying, listen, I love you. I want to save you. I want to rescue you. That's called grace extended to you. And then what is faith? Faith is your sin-stained hand reaching back up to God and saying, God, I need you to help me. I need you to rescue me. I need you to do for me what I cannot do by myself. So again, the question I gotta ask is, have you been born again? You're like, preacher, you're using a disciple in us. I'm like, I can't, I can't, you can't be discipled unless you become a disciple. So have you been born again? Have you been changed? Not perfectly, but obviously. Supernaturally, not superficially, supernaturally. Would your family, would your friends, it's like something has changed in him. He's still kind of a bozo at times. He still makes some mistakes, but when he does, man, he goes, he goes right back to God. I mean, ask God right where you're sitting. Ask God in Brevard. Ask God in Hendersonville. Ask God West Asheville, Franklin, et cetera. Ask God. God, have, have you done this in my life? Have you done this in my life? And then, because the Bible says, oh, call in the name of the Lord will be saved. And right now, with your eyes open, your head up, and everybody else is, Head up and eyes open. Right where you are, if you're like, have you done this? In, and you're like, I'm not sure. I don't think I have. Some of you are like, I know I have it because there hadn't been any fruit. There hadn't been any change. Then right where you sit, just ask God. Just, God, I believe. I turn. I, 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 I surrender. I surrender. I want you to birth me again. I want you to, I want you to come in and change me. I surrender. I surrender to the Lordship of Jesus what you did on that cross counted for me, so I'm now turning to you. And you just tell them in your heart. Tell them in your heart. You can say it verbally if you want to, but tell them in your heart, you know what, I, I wanna believe in you. I believe in you that what you did on that cross counted for me. Now, by the way, you're like, how do we know if that happened? I tell you, one of the marks of a, a believer is they don't keep it quiet. So here's my challenge. If you're like, I prayed that prayer. I just, I just gave my life to Christ as best I know how. Tell somebody, tell the friend you came with, go out to your lobby. When you go out to the lobby, what are you gonna do? You're just gonna go over there, we got, you're like, hey, can I get one of those new believer boxes? Can I get one of those new believer boxes? Because I, I could have you raise your hand, I could have you look at me, I could have every head bowed and every eye closed and all that, but here's what I wanna say. If you gave your life to Christ, if you actually surrender to the Lordship of Christ and he birthed you again, there's gonna be something in you that has to tell somebody. And so tell somebody. Tell your friend, tell your parents, tell the people in the lobby, come tell me, come tell your campus pastor and say, like, you know, I gave my life to Christ, what do I do now? And we'll probably get you a new believer's box and it has a Bible in there and has some instructions, that'd be an awesome way to start. Okay, second, second thing, we do this response this time all the time. We're gonna have a response. We actually, true confessions, this is how awesome our music people are. We had another song picked and when we were singing that song, Trust in God, I was like, we gotta do that one again. I mean, we have to do that one again. Because number one, here's what I want you to do. Are you still amazed that Jesus saved you? I mean, are you amazed at that? Or are you like, our, are, are you like our, one of our young pastors who used to take people up to the Pisgah Inn and now it's like, ah, whatever. I mean, it's, it's still amazing, but he just got used to it. Have you gotten used to the fact that God took you from darkness and put you into light? Did he put you from an enemy of God to a friend of God? Or is that something that's like, that still amazes me? Well, if it still amazes you, then we're going to sing like saved people. And here's what I'd ask you to do. I'd ask you to just turn the, turn the notch up one bit. Do one modification when it comes to this response time. If you're going to be singing one modification, and what, that might, what might that be? I mean, maybe it's the fact that all you gotta do, you don't normally sing, and you, it's actually gonna sing. 
Maybe you're like gonna go kind of creep a hand up, all right? This, 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 not that. You're, not, you're not getting crazy. All you're doing is like, you know what? I'm, I surrender to God and I'm excited. I mean, you do that when the Panthers win. I know that's not often, but you do that when the Panthers win. You're like, yeah! I mean, you only had, what, twice last year, three times. You like you do it all four minutes of this one. Put your hand up. Some of you uh, might need to bend the knee. You got some stuff you need to trust God with. Some of you need to trust God and you're like, I need to give my life to Christ. And I just know, then you need to, if you didn't do it a few minutes ago, you need to get down to the front of the church, hit your knees before almighty God and cry out to him. And I promise you this, based on what God's word said, you cry out to God, you call out to God for salvation. You're like, God, I was in this miry pit and you picked me up. Guess what? That he will save you. That is your first act of worship. Maybe you got a burden on your heart. You need to trust God with something that's Something that's in your home, something that's in your marriage, something that's at your work, something that God's pushing you to do. And you're like, I gotta trust God with this. I gotta trust God with this. Then you come up and kneel. Come up here on these little praying benches and just kneel and give it over to God. Uh, it, it takes a couple minutes to ramp. And then again, what we do is we don't, again, we don't take up an offering, but we do wanna give God our first and best because God gave us his first and his best. So why don't you stand to your feet and I'm gonna pray. So stand to your feet and we're gonna respond. It's not a time where we leave or try to check out. This is the time where for four minutes, this is like the back part of, of our worship. And again, you know that people would love to meet you afterwards, but right now, right now, let's respond. We're gonna come and pray. We're gonna sing like saved people or we're gonna bring like saved people. So Lord, we're grateful. We are grateful that we have an exclamation point, not a question mark. We have an exclamation point that you birthed us again. You birthed us from above and you have breathed life into a bunch of dead bones, and you're raising up an army. God, thank you, that's all of grace, it's all of grace. Help us be amazed at that. Help us be continually amazed that you took us as orphans and you adopted us into your family. Let us never get tired of that. God, help us in faith believe that for the one that we're praying for, even now. If we hadn't put a one on the wall, help us go in faith and like, I'm putting my one on the wall. I'm praying for my one right there. But God, thank you that all around us are evidences of the new birth. God, we pray that people, if they just gave their life to Christ and actually surrendered to Christ, are gonna do so now, help us to come alongside them and encourage and cheer them on. But God, we wanna echo as a people, as an army that you breathe life into, that we wanna trust in God. We want to trust in God. You have always been there. You are faithful, and we want to act like we know that. In Jesus' name, amen.